need to make sure that the audience is following every word because every word should matter in terms of telling your story. If there's one person who knows about choosing the exact right words to tell a story, it's Glenn Slater. He's written the lyrics to the songs in some of the most popular Broadway musicals, animated movies, and television shows of all time, including Disney's Tangled, The Little Mermaid, Sister Act, School of Rock, and many more. I'm Elizabeth Pearson Gar, and this is the Experience Podcast. In this episode, we get to experience what it's like to be a big-time lyricist. My guest, Glenn Slater, has won a Grammy, an Emmy, and been nominated for three Tony Awards. He often collaborates with heavyweight composers like Alan Menken and Andrew Lloyd Webber. But beyond his many accomplishments, he's a super nice and super smart guy. Talking with him was like taking a master class in how to create a musical. So... Take a seat in the theater, settle in, and enjoy learning from lyricist Glenn Slater. Hello, Glenn. Thanks for being here. Such a pleasure. I'm really happy to get to talk to you because I love creative people and I love the whole creative process. And so I really am excited to dig in and kind of get to the root of it with you because you're such an accomplished lyricist and a creative person. So can we just kind of get to the bottom of it? Let's start your day. Let's say that you are working on a project that's ongoing and you're working on lyrics for a song. What would you start doing? All right. So first of all, speaking for myself and for most people in this industry, nobody has one project going on. Everybody is juggling four or five projects at once because one of the issues with the film industry, the theater industry, the television industry is that you never know what's going to happen. You never know if your project is real until it's actually on a screen or on a stage. So everybody is juggling many things and with several things in process at once. So on any given day, I'm working on two or three different shows during the course of my day. And my day usually stretches from about 11 in the morning, uh, which is when I sit down to start working, until, sadly, until 4 or 5 a.m. usually. What? So, yeah. 4 or 5 a.m.? Mm-hmm. So in order to work on any one particular show, I tend to need a block of time, like a good four or five hour block, because I don't just sit and write the words. What I need to do is I need to imagine the full mise-en-scene of whatever it is I'm working on. I need to imagine the setting, the characters, what the actors are doing, what the choreographer is having them do, what props they're going to have, what the sets look like and how the actors move within the sets. And so I have to create all that in my mind in order to get a good picture of how the songs and how the words are going to fit into all those moving pieces. Recreating that in your mind is sort of a massive mental effort. So it takes a little while to plunge yourself into that, almost like plugging yourself into like a virtual reality setting. And then it takes a while to disengage from it as well. And in order to get to work on two or three projects during a day, I need to do that process of plugging in and unplugging several times a day. Once I've plugged in, if I'm already in process, depending on who I'm working with, I will have an assignment to write a song for a particular moment, for a particular character or group of characters. If I'm working with a, with a composer who likes to do the music first, I will have a piece of music already written to work with, with no words, just a, a piece of music. And what I will do is I will try to figure out the best arrangement of words to express what the character needs to say, what we, the authors, are trying to get across, what will be singable in terms of the actor's voice, what will be audible for the audience in terms of just uh, phonics and how words and music work together, and then how that will work in tandem with the movement and the setting and all that sort of stuff. So it's balancing all those elements at once and trying to get them to fit into this, this musical grid. I work on paper. I have... a a certain kind of lined paper that I've been using for 25 years. I have certain pens that I've been using for 25 years. I have a particular brand of rhyming dictionary that I use. It's the Penguin Rhyming Dictionary. It is a British rhyming dictionary. I made the terrible mistake of picking that one up first, and now I have to, in my mind, translate British vowel sounds into American vowel sounds (laughs) whenever I use it. And it's an actual paper dictionary. It's It's not an an online... It's an actual paper dictionary. I've been using it for so long that I can just sort of 
flip automatically to where I need to be. And I've been using it for so long that my eyes kind of know where to go on the page. So I find it easier to use. I have a thesaurus, an old Roger's thesaurus. There is one particular edition, the third edition. It went out of print like in 1990. So I have to hunt them down online when I wear through them. And then I sit for several hours and with that pad and I just start writing. If it's a particular title that I'm trying to rhyme to, I will make lists of things that rhyme with those words that I need to rhyme. If it is a, for example, I'm working on a song that is from the point of view of a mouse who is looking for things in the street to bring back to its nest. And so I will make a list of what would that mouse be looking for? What are the different kinds of fabric it might use? What are the different kinds of cheese it might look for? Just lists of words that might have interesting rhymes, that might have interesting usages, that might spark something. Usually by this point in the process, I will already have a title in mind, and I will start trying to figure out how do those details start accruing around that title? How do I start getting concepts uh, that I want to get across to the audience? Ideas, what that mouse might be thinking, what that mouse's grand story arc might be, how might this song fit into that grand arc, and what words might connect the audience to that idea. And so it's a, it's a process of finding the words, sorting through the words, letting the words kind of marinate, beginning to string those words together, feeling out how do those words fit on the music, singing them to myself, to that melody, and then gradually, bit by bit, building up chunks of word assemblages, uh, whether those are full verses, whether they're just sentences, whether they are prose that I haven't figured out how to get into rhyme schemes yet, whether they're possible rhyming ideas, and I'll just fill up page after page after page. Usually on a song, it takes me anywhere between 10 and 20 pages of scratch paper, um, which I fill up pretty completely to get to the end of the song. I'll get to a point where I'll have the fodder for the song. Not, not a full song on paper, but uh, usually several chunks of verses. And then I'll start bringing them onto the computer and laying them out into lyric form on a sheet. At that point, I'll be able to tell what do I have. Do I have several verses worth or just one verse? Do I have enough for a full song or not quite yet? Do I have everything for the verse except an, a missing line? Once I put it on the computer, I can sort of see what's there and what's not there. And then I can start filling in the missing blanks. And is this the same process whether you have the music first or not? Whether you're going lyric first or, or music first? Well, if I'm starting with music first, it's that accretion kind of a process. If I'm starting lyrics first, slightly different in that I have a little bit more freedom because I don't have that grid of the music to work to. So if it's lyric first, then I start with a little prose squib of what I want to say. Just a paragraph, just like a sort of an outline form of how I can imagine the argument of the song or the emotional movement of the song working. And then I'll start to write in prose, just again, little chunks of here's how I see it working, and then I can start breaking it down into rhymes. I generally find it easier to work with music first because the music provides a box for me to work within. Like a structure and, or something. I, yeah, I would, you, yeah, yeah. I thought it was interesting you said it was more freedom because I thought that would also could be kind of overwhelming. Like you can go anywhere if you don't have any structure to start with. It, exactly, and that's paradoxically more restricting in some ways. You know, when you have unlimited choices, when you can do anything, every decision becomes a branching decision tree that can branch out into infinity. Right. And because I ultimately don't control what the music is, it's a branching infinity tree at the end of which are a lot of black boxes of, am I making the right decision? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Because ultimately I have to hand it off to a composer who would then either write good music to it or bad music to it or come to me and say, I don't know how to write music to it. So if the music is there and there's a box, it's harder to write to in some ways, but it's easier to get clarity because I know what the boundaries are. And once I know what the boundaries are, it's also easier to figure out how do I get out of the box? Like, what can I write to get me out of those restrictions to make it feel freer and feel like I didn't have a box to begin with? And is that sometimes a dance? Like, you might start with some lyrics... Your composer will do some music. You do more lyrics. It's, it's not just one and then the other. It's, it's yeah. a building process. Yeah. I think 
the sort of the cliche question to ask is, which comes first, the music or the lyrics? <laughs> I've and, heard that many times. Not as many yes. times as you've heard it, I'm sure. But <laughs> Oh, my God. So many times. <laughs> and that's not a question that really has an answer because it works differently for every pairing. And even within that pairing, it works differently depending on the various strengths of the two collaborators, what the process is on that particular show, time restraints. I mean, so many different elements. So the very first thing that happens in a collaboration is you sit down and you talk about the idea. You talk about the characters. You talk about the scene. You talk about what's the emotional movement. Where does the character begin emotionally? Where does the character end emotionally? You talk about the plot. Where does the plot for the song begin and where does the plot for the song end? I had read that when I was doing some research to interview you that every song needs to move the emotional arc of the character forward. Absolutely. Unlike a pop song where the song can sit in the same place for four minutes because you're sort of half listening. A pop song is all about polishing one idea and bringing out the hooks and making it shine and making it a listenable experience. And you can hear a pop song 30 times and it's always the same experience. For a theater song, you may only hear that song once and you're not hearing it in the context of, oh, I'm driving my car or I'm doing the laundry or I'm in a dance club. You're hearing it in the context of, I'm in a story. I wanna know what happens in that story. So part of the job that we have to do as the composer and the lyricist is tell that story. Make sure that we're not holding the story back, that we're not repeating points that you already know, that we're not stopping the flow of the story from happening. And so when we're in that early planning stage, we're looking at how do we time plot twists so that every verse and chorus of the song brings you to a new point in the plot. Even if it's just a little emotional turn, that counts as plot moving forward. Even if it's just a realization, that's plot moving forward. That's something the audience didn't know before. But you need to keep moving forward because once you sit in the same place, the audience is going to say, all right, now we're just repeating ourselves. I know that. I can stop listening. And if they stop listening, then you've lost them and they've, they've fallen off the plot a little bit. So the first thing we do is talk through plot and talk through emotional, the emotional arc of the song and make sure we're on the same page. And you're doing that with the whole creative team or is this just you and the composer? So when you start on a show, musicals are all about structure. Most musicals are between two hours and two hours and 20 minutes long. For whatever reason, nobody knows why, but longer than that, and people lose patience with musicals. It's just too much for the brain to take in. So you have a finite amount of room, usually an hour and 40 minutes to two hours and 20 minutes. Within that amount of time, you need to tell a two-act story because, again, for whatever reason, people tend to need an intermission in the middle of that. Within that two-act structure, generally the first act is going to be longer than the second act, Just psychologically, it works better that way. So you're looking at a first act that is 10 to 12 scenes, a second act that's 8 to 10 scenes. Within those 20 scenes, you need to take your story and figure out how does that story break down into 20 scenes? What are the 20 big emotional points that happen to build that story? And this is true whether or not you are taking an existing movie and trying to adapt it into a musical. Whatever the structure of that movie is, You need to look at it and say, what are the 20 points? If it's a story that you're coming up with, an original story, same thing. Every scene needs to build to an emotional high point because songs function as an emotional sort of bump. And every time you get to a song, because of the music, the way music works on our brains, it's going to magnify that moment. So you need to structure each scene so that it builds to a song. That song has to embody the emotional high point of the scene. That emotional high point of the scene needs to fit into a 20 point structure. And I'm, I'm exaggerating. I mean, it, it doesn't need to be that highly structured. Maybe it's 18, maybe it's 22. There's flexibility, but you're looking at building this sort of structure, a scaffolding of emotional high points that build and that interact with each other in such a way so that you're not having two ballad high points at the same point. You're not having two group numbers happening at the same point. You're not having too many comedy songs in a row. You need to sort of have a a varied structure so that the structure has stability and sturdiness and doesn't feel lopsided. 
I remember reading an interview with Lin-Manuel Miranda that Stephen Sondheim had given him that advice, variety, Mm -hmm. that you need to have upbeat songs and then ballads, that that's what's going to keep you. The last thing you want to see is the audience's eyes sort of rolling back in their heads. Exactly. And the way to avoid that is to have a whole bunch of variety. Keep the audience guessing. Yeah. You constantly want to be feeding the audience a new experience, a twist on what they just heard, a sense that things are moving forward. And if you have two production numbers in a row, they're going to feel so similar that the audience is not going to feel like they're moving. They're going to feel like they're hearing, well, we just heard that it's a wonderful clam bake, and now we're hearing that it's a wonderful clam bake. Again, even if it's not about the clam bake, it's going to feel like you're in a rut. So you want to move from that big, body, rowdy group number to a ballad, to a duet, to a comedy song, to a number with five people, back to a big group number. You want to make sure that you're mixing male and female voices. You want to make sure that you're mixing the main characters with minor characters. Just constantly finding a way to keep the audience's sort of emotional investment off balance enough that they don't feel like they're in a familiar place, but familiar enough that they are with you and moving with you through the plot. So the first meetings that you have, and this could go on for months, is all about just creating that structure, figuring out how to create an outline that does your whole plot, that keeps your emotional arcs feeling supported, Make sure that you have the song moments that you need to get that sense of variety. Once you have that in place, only then do we go off and create individual songs. And then we kind of do the process again. It's like I said, it's all about structure. Once you've created that big superstructure for the musical as a whole, then you're looking at the scene and creating a structure for the scene. How much dialogue is there? How much action is there? Where does the song go so that everything is balanced in the right way? You don't want to have a song at the beginning of the scene and then trickle out into dialogue that goes on for too long because it will feel anticlimactic. You don't want to have a lot of action before a song because it will feel like the song is anticlimactic to the action. So it's, it's trying to find that wow. balance of elements. And then once you're sitting down to write the song, again, same thing in a microcosm. It's how do we balance the verses and the choruses Have you balanced long phrases with short phrases, high notes with lower notes, big belting vocals with pattery vocals? And then how do you balance all of those within the score so that you're not repeating the same dynamic over and over again? And then other elements too, probably like comedic phrases versus touching emotional moments. Right, right. Getting all of those effects are, it sounds so reductive when I say it this way, but a lot of it is simply getting the structure right. To make a joke land, it's all about set up, set up, punchline, over and over again. And so whether you're doing set up, set up with the rhyme, whether you're doing it with phrases, whether the music is providing that sense of set up, set up, payoff, you need that in a comedy song, and you have to structure the song accordingly so that the payoffs are happening at a steady rate, so that your first laugh is a small laugh, your second laugh is a bigger laugh, Your final laugh is the biggest laugh of all, because if you have your big laugh first, that third laugh is going to feel anticlimactic and not funny. And so it's constantly looking for that sense of where's the structure? How do I get the the structure right? It sounds so unromantic. I'm making it sound like building a bridge or something. (laughs) Yeah, no, no, no. But, you know, you're probably working, especially at your level. You're working with these super creative, highly intelligent people. It must be really exciting to just have these ideas bouncing off each other. Well, you know, it's funny. When you, when you start doing this, you do just kind of work by intuition and you just start writing. And it usually takes you a very long time to write the song. But it, it has all of that sense of like, oh, I'm being inspired and I'm you know, writing my thoughts and emotions down on the paper and capturing something. The longer you do it, the more you understand where the right turns and the wrong turns are, what works and what doesn't work you sort of streamline the process. And the more you streamline it, the more obvious it becomes like, oh, it's a structure. And there are different kinds of structures. I know what kind of structure is going to work in this particular setting. I know what kind of structure is going to work for this particular scene. I can just cut to the chase and get to the structure. And it cuts down the time it takes to write it by an enormous amount of time. And it cuts down on the the angst of writing it by quite a bit. That's where the experience kicks in. Yeah. So once we're working on the song, The composer and myself will sit in a room, usually by a piano, and we'll talk through the character. We'll talk through the character's voice, what kinds of things the character might say, 
what the character might be doing on stage. We'll just set up for ourselves that mise-en-scene so that we can almost visualize it. The composer will usually start talking to me about what do I imagine the music sounding like, or they'll have an idea of what they imagine the music will sound like. Sometimes it's a musical style that fits in with the setting of the piece. So if you're writing a piece set in Spain, you're going to be looking at rumbas and mambos and uh, tarantellas and that kind of a thing. If you're writing something set in the 1960s, you're looking at Motown and psychedelic rock and whatever it is, and you're sort of sifting through those various feels and influences looking for the sound, the uh, performer, the whatever that comes closest to the feel that you're looking for. And then once you have a sound in mind, sometimes you'll talk about a specific performer. Either you'll know the actor you're working with or you'll have an actor, like a dream actor in mind, and you'll think about what would work for that person. And then once you've talked through that and we've started gelling an idea of how the song should feel, I will start throwing out possible titles. What about this? What about that? Until I come up with something that makes the composer say, oh, I like that. And then the composer will sit at the piano and start working with that title. What I'm describing right now is specifically my process with Alan Menken. It works differently with other people. So Alan will start, he'll sit at the piano and he'll just start playing with that title. How does it sound at the beginning of a chorus? How does it sound at the end of a chorus? How does it sound if I start the verse with that title? What if it's a very... And he's so moment? prolific, he can just sit down and play a bunch of different stuff. Just, yeah. I'll try this style, I'll try that style. Yeah, he's, he's insane. He literally, the music just comes out of him. There's no mental block at all. There's no thought process. It's just pure intuition and it comes out. And he can adjust that intuition like within degrees. Sometimes his intuition says something that makes no sense to you intellectually, but it is just absolutely right. So we will experiment with different feels, with different styles, until we land on the right thing. And that's a tandem experience with him saying, what about this? And me saying, oh, I like that, keep going. Or with him playing something and me saying, that's not quite right. Can it be a little bit more uh, mysterious? Can you give me a little bit more sense of um, disquiet under the surface? Can you give me a little bit more happiness in the chorus? Can you go from that sense of disquiet building into something more celebratory that erupts when we get to the hook? I can give him those little directorial notes and he will be able to on the fly just kind of incorporate them into what he's doing, which is kind of astonishing, but very cool. And nice that you have that relationship with each other, that you're so comfortable with each other at this point. It's been, what, 25 years or something of working yeah. together that you can do that comfortably and respond to each other in that way. He, does he give you notes that way also? Yeah, yeah, writing? absolutely. So once we've landed on a piece of music and he has sort of sketched out the melody in that way, I'll take it home. And I will then begin that process of, all right, here's my box. Here's the box I have to work in. Here's the, the melody and the, the way the verses and the chorus goes together. What music does, music functions in a musical as the subtext, as the emotional subtext of any scene. It has its own logic it affects you in a certain way. And so I can't fight that. That's kind of the underpinning. It's as if you're a, a sculptor and you've been given a piece of marble and the marble has a certain, you know, has seams and it has a certain way the, the, the rock moves. And you can't just carve anything out of a piece of marble. You have to figure out where are the patterns? Where can I cut? Where can I chisel to what shape will emerge from that? And so it's sort of the same thing with the music. There's an emotional shape to a piece of music and I have to sort of work with that emotional shape and figure out how does that emotional shape map to that emotional arc that we talked about and where does it rise, where does it fall, where does the character have a revelation, where does the character lean into the feeling. It's sort of an intuitive process, but you can feel it as you're doing it. And so this is when you're sitting down with your special pad of paper and your special pens and you're yeah. working at two and three in the morning and you're just yeah. looking. I was wondering, are you, are you literally in an office? Are you taking walks around the block? Do you listen to music or how are you getting the inspiration? So I have an office and I have a dining room table and those two function as my office. Uh, my wife is also a composer and a lyricist and we are on slightly different schedules. She's a morning person. I'm a night person. So she gets the <laughs> office in the morning and I get the table in the morning, and then we switch in the late afternoon, and then at night I get the, I'm at the dining room table. 
you get anything you want at night. Everyone else is sleeping, <laughs> I imagine. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I'm sitting there with this piece of music and I'm trying to ride the piece of music. And as I'm writing phrases and lists of words onto the pads and starting to coalesce them into a lyric, I'm singing them to the music that I have, trying to test, does it sound right? Does it feel right? Is the intent of the lyric matching the emotional flow of the music? Are they riding together? Are they marrying together? This is partly an intellectual process. It's partly picking out the words that say what the character is trying to say at that moment. It's partly a cultural process in terms of, all right, this character is from a specific place in a specific time. What words would they use? What words wouldn't they use? Would they use contractions? How would they refer to themselves? How would they refer to other people? Trying to make sure that you're matching that. It's a process of getting it to match with the script because the script writer is going to have their own writing style. It needs to feel seamless. Mm -hmm. So making sure that I'm not using any language that wouldn't feel out of place in the script, making sure that I'm doing, I'm carrying over some of the language from the script into the songs. So I mentioned earlier that you have 20 scenes. Those 20 big emotional plot points need to add up into one big emotional hole, but they also need to add up into one big conceptual whole. What is the show about? What are we trying to say? What's the argument? Not necessarily an argument in terms of a courtroom, but an argument in terms of like a thesis. Like how are you building your, your point more or less? And each of the songs, because they are part of that 20 point structure or 18 point structure, whatever it is, needs to be part of that bigger thematic question and statement. So how does this song push that argument forward? How does that song not push that argument forward? An example, we did a show called uh, A Bronx Tale, based on the movie, and what that show is about is how do, you, how do you be a man in a patriarchal society? You can function either by trying to instill fear or by trying to instill love. And those two poles of love and fear are the sort of the poles of this show. And what we try to do in every song of the sh in the show is use those ideas as touchstones so that there's no point emotionally where we're too far from that theme. They don't necessarily have to be about that theme directly, but they face it in a way. They are always gravitating towards those themes in one, one way or another so that emotionally we always know we're on track, so that we're building, 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 building the idea so that when it gets to the end, you feel like you've arrived somewhere. And if you don't do it in every song, the audience doesn't know what you're building to and they fall off that ladder and they don't get there when you're trying to get them there. In addition to all that sort of intellectual work, there's also just mechanical work. So the human voice, when it does a long vowel, the throat opens. A short vowel, the throat closes. When you sing a long note, the throat opens. When you sing a short note, the throat closes. So what I'm also trying to do is to place long vowels on long notes, short vowels on short notes. The human tongue and teeth can only do certain consonants together at a certain speed. So if the music is moving at a certain pace, you can't put certain consonants together. The human ear, if you end a word with one letter and start the next word with the next letter, doesn't hear that letter. So right now, if you're on Twitter at all, there's this big controversy. Apparently Bruce Springsteen in the song Thunder Road wrote, Mary's dress sways. And for 50 years, however long people have been listening to that, 45 years, people have heard it as Mary's dress waves. Well, that's because dress and sways both have that S sound. When you sing them together... You lose the S. You lose the S. So you have to make sure that that doesn't happen. Because again, in a musical, you may only hear that song the one time you're in the theater. You need to make sure that the audience is following every word, because every word should matter in terms of telling your story. And worse, if they hear something, if the ear snags on a sound, if you're trying to figure out, what did they just say there? Did I hear that right? Suddenly you're paying attention to two lines ago, not the line that you should be listening to, and then you get lost. And then you stop paying attention to the song, and then you are off the story, and now you're not coming with me on that ladder that I'm trying to build. So it's balancing all these different elements, the mechanical elements, wow. the auditory elements, the thematic elements, the character elements, the language elements, into a whole, and trying to get them to coalesce, to match up with that music, into what will eventually feel like a seamless whole. One of the great lyricists, I don't remember which one it was, it might have been Frank Lesser, said that music makes you feel something and words make you think things. And when a song works, it makes you feel a thought. 
And that's ultimately what we're trying to do is marry the music and the, and the words together so that the emotion, the feeling, and the, the intellectual side, the word side, become indistinguishable and you just take them in as one whole and you, you don't separate them into, well, here's what I'm supposed to be thinking, here's what I'm supposed to be thinking. You just go with it and uh, experience both of those things at the same time. And that's what makes musicals wonderful when they're great, is that they provide this sort of experience that you can't get anywhere else. So is that sort of intuitive for you at this point? Or do you have to think that through? Like, let's say you come up with some great lyrics that match the music. And then you think, oh, man, now I have to go through that whole process of the long notes and the short vowels and all of that. (laughs) Or do you just know it at this point because you've done it enough? Well, I don't have to think about it intellectually. I kind of know what works and what doesn't work. But every song provides its own separate puzzle. Every song is a different thing you have to crack. And... The hard part can be different for each song. Sometimes it's very hard to get the emotional tone right because you don't know exactly what the character is thinking. So for example, for the movie Tangled, Rapunzel, our main character, has been sort of kept in the tower by her mother. She likes her tower, it's her home. She is resourceful, so she knows how to have fun and how to do things. She loves her mother. She's slightly puzzled at why she can't leave. She instinctively knows that she should want to leave and does want to leave, but also feels guilty about wanting to leave. And that's a lot of emotions that are sometimes contradictory and don't necessarily go together. But we had to figure out a way in the opening song for that movie of expressing all those things in one song in a way that you get her without thinking about it too much. And so that was a a sort of an emotional puzzle that we had as and it took many, many tries to get it right. Conversely, I'm working on a song. I was just working on it today for a new show. The piece of music that Alan gave me has a lot of fluttery notes. So the melody goes like, bum, bum, da ba da ba da da ba da ba da ba da ba 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 So all those da ba da ba da oh my God, it's so hard to sing words to that. You basically have to have a sentence structure where you are alternating vowels, consonants, vowels, consonants, vowels, consonants, Otherwise, the mouth will trip on it and the audience won't understand it. And so I knew exactly what I needed to say. The problem was getting that vowel, consonant, vowel, consonant structure to work in addition to the rhyme scheme, in addition to all the other things. Having it move the story forward and Mm -hmm. make sense. and Yeah, and the sticking point there was, all right, like I know what I need to say, but I can't get the, I don't have the words that have the right consonants. I don't have the words that have the right vowels. And now I have to come up with an alternate that may get me further away from the meaning I want. So how do I balance staying as close to the meaning while staying understandable? I'm going to jump back for a second because earlier, you earlier you asked me when I sit down, am I, how much of it is sitting at the desk and how much of it is like inspiration? What do I do for inspiration? So there's two modes. There's brute force mode. And then there's like subconscious mode. And the brute force mode is that period where I'm making the lists and I'm trying every possible rhyme and I'm looking for the different word combinations that might work. I'm looking for different ways to say the same thing in hopes of getting a rhyme out of it or getting a pithy phrase or getting the right consonants. And often it is fruitless. Often it is frustrating. Often the best way to say something, it's a word that has three possible rhymes and none of them work for you and you can't get there from here. And so I build into my writing schedule a certain amount of doing that and then a certain amount of subconscious time where I am not sitting in front of the paper and I am reading a book or taking a walk or on an exercise bike or hanging out with my kids or taking a shower or whatever it is where I'm not thinking about it, but it's, it's happening under the surface. And you know, the way I usually describe it is that you, you have to bang your head against the wall for a certain amount of time And it feels like you're just turning your brain into pulp. But every time you bang your head against that wall, you are softening the wall. You're weakening the wall and you're figuring out where the soft points are. And once you've done that, you can go off. And when you come back to the wall, you kind of instinctively know where the softest point is. And then boom, one more hit and your head goes through and you can see daylight on the other side. So it's almost equal time. It's almost like if I have two hours of sitting and scratching at the pad, somehow worked into that two hours. And it's not a block of two and then another block of two. It's sometimes 20 minutes at the pad and then 20 minutes of like looking at Twitter or an hour and a half sitting at the pad and then 
an hour and a half playing a video game or whatever it is. Yeah, I can relate to that because you hear like writers need to have a a consistent schedule, right? You can't expect anything to happen if you're never going to sit down and try to write. But I often find that my inspiration hits when I'm trying to fall asleep or in the shower or driving the car or whatever. So it is, it's a combination, I think, of, of both, just like you say. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a question of you can't rely on either. You need both. You need the work and the inspiration. The yeah. work kind of plows the field for the inspiration to then grow in. But you have to put in that work plowing the field so that when the inspiration strikes, it has a bed, it has the right water, it has the right food, and it can take root very quickly. Glenn shared so much interesting information and had so many great stories that I couldn't edit our interview down into just one episode. So part two is coming next week. We'll continue with the theme of inspiration and get into what inspired him to write the lyrics for songs in Tangled, as well as the TV shows Rapunzel's Tangled Adventure and Gallivant. And we'll cover a lot more, too. Many of Glenn's experiences can apply to all of our lives, even those of us who aren't working on the world's grandest stages. Here are some of my takeaways. Number one, true collaboration requires honesty, humility, and genuine give and take. To get that from someone, and to give it to someone, is a gift. Two, if every song is its own puzzle, so too are many circumstances we encounter in life. Approach them with wonder and curiosity. There always is a solution, it just might take a while to find it. Three, balance is necessary in the song, in the score, in our lives. Four, Sometimes we need to work in brute force mode, and sometimes we need to operate in unconscious mode. And finally, number five, when you find something you love that's good and useful, like a particular thesaurus from 1990, do whatever you need to do to hold on to it. I'd like to thank the incredibly creative Glenn Slater for sharing his experiences with me. Remember, he'll be back on the podcast again next week please visit our website, theexperiencepodcast.net, to explore other episodes and find out how to follow us on social media. And if you liked what you heard, please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. It helps others discover us. I'm Elizabeth Pearson-Gar. Thanks for joining in the experience.